All right, guys, we're going back to the Magic Kingdom, which is just about to celebrate its 50th anniversary, which is just mind-boggling. Seems like only yesterday I was standing in front of the castle for the 45th anniversary, and boy, a lot has changed in those five years. But if we jump backwards in time, we can see even more has changed in the last 50, including these, huh? Now this is a part of Disney history. Weird. Now, last time we were in the Magic Kingdom, we took an epic trip through the past from the first building open to the public at Walt Disney World, through the ferry boat system, and all the way up to Cinderella's Castle, passing through the main street of yesteryear. Of course, I felt like I was just scratching the surface when all of a sudden I realized, holy cow, we're already out of time. So today we're gonna jump right in and go straight ahead to the future of the past. Now, obviously 50 years changes so much that the park we're strolling around in today is very different from the one that opened in 1971. And that's all to be expected. But what most people don't realize is just how incomplete the original park was. And nowhere was that more true than in the world of the future, Tomorrowland. Nowadays, Tomorrowland is so packed full of buildings and popular attractions that they've literally run out of space so that the new Tron attraction actually had to be built outside of the original boundaries of the park. There is so much going on here now and so many people flocking here that it's hard to believe on opening day in October of 1971, only two attractions were open here. The Tomorrowland Skyway, which was located right over here next to the modern Space Mountain, and funny enough, the Autopia, or should I say the Grand Prix Raceway. So it's funny if you think about it, the most futuristic thing you could do in the original Tomorrowland was drive a car. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Tomorrowland was so behindhand and so on the back burner that I believe they didn't even finalize the plans for it until about 1973. So change came to Tomorrowland quickly and often in the first couple of years. But before we keep talking about that, we have to take a giant step back because whatever Tomorrowland lacked in terms of rides on opening day, in terms of looks, the original Tomorrowland, at least out here, had it going on. Check this out. Now that is one heck of a Tomorrowland. Dude, look at that. This clip is from a little later in the mid 1970s. You can tell because the rocket jets are up there already. And boy, is that different from the view that we've got out here today. Let me tell you. Actually, other than being able to see the rocket jets back there, it wasn't much different than the view on opening day. Like check out this photo from 1972 that Scott sent me here. Look at that. The epic pinnacle fountains were already in place. The show buildings we still have today we're already there the people mover track layout was even already in place so clearly that was part of the plan from the beginning but man as cool as i think tomorrowland looks today back then what a sleek design huh it's impressive <laughs> Here's another photo from 1971 I borrowed from Gorillas Don't Blog here and look at the lighting scheme on it come on man that that is cool. I mean, I know that's pretty plain Jane looking compared to the way it looks today. It's a little more dynamic today. But as a big fan of retro futurism, dude, I've got to say I love that sort of clean mid-century modern almost Jetsons vibe. Dude, I mean, just look at this shot from 1976. Look at those fountains going. You got the palm trees growing back there. I mean, that's just an unbelievably cool visual. Very different than it is today. But also, you can see the outlines of the buildings are still there, those sort of corners where the giant cascading fountains were and the pinnacles. And I think we have evidence of time travel in this photo because, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that Mig V from Magic Journeys? Weird. Now, if we step ahead a little bit, you can see that those cascading fountains and the spires themselves would get bedazzled later on. Look at that sort of mural tile on there. It definitely broke up the sort of minimalistic plain shapes a little bit, having that design there. But the interesting thing is this photo is from 1989. Basically, that classic Tomorrowland look more or less lasted into the 90s. It's amazing to think about just how different things are today. Yet if you look closely, you'll notice a lot of things have stayed the same. You know, stepping back out a little bit to the hub, look at this. Look how much it's changed here. And yet, way back in 1989, the sea monster was still going strong over here. 
Now, I didn't match this up perfectly. Because there's a new tree in the way. Darn newcomer, but I still thought that was worth taking a look at. All right, let's head into Tomorrowland. Now in November 1971, just a month after opening, the Circle Vision 360 Theater in this building did open up featuring America the Beautiful. And I believe by Christmas, Flight to the Moon opened up across the way as well. So Tomorrowland wasn't bare of attractions for very long. They expanded this South Show building here for a show called If You Had Wings, sponsored by Eastern Airlines. We all know them. And between 1973 and the end of 1975, all a whole bunch of changes happened in rapid succession, including the addition of the old original rocket jets up on top of the people mover loading platform, which were shaped rather differently than the ones that are up there today, which match Disneyland. Thus the name rocket jet. See how they're a little more jet-like, a little more space shuttle influenced perhaps? Then of course they acquired the old carousel of progress, which had been in Disneyland in California. The only difference here is that the show building revolved the opposite way and lacked the second story that our original carousel of progress had where you would exit past the model of progress city the same model that's on the people who are here today and the show was much the same as it is today i mean the animatronics were a little simpler and obviously the last scene was very different as it was set in the future of you know the 1960s and 70s and you know not the weird the weird 90s version we've got now. And I know before all this stuff, there were plans to sort of update that last scene in Carousel of Progress again. But I kind of think it would be awesome if they just went back to the old retro future, since that's, that's sort of part of the charm of it all. Just one man's opinion. Anyway, of course, after Carousel of Progress. In 1975, we got the original Space Mountain here at Walt Disney World, something that had been planned at Disneyland for years, but had never come to fruition. We proudly present Space so yes, I'm sorry Anaheim fans, but Walt Disney World Space Mountain is the original. And some say, still the best. Finally, of course, we got the Wedway here, the People Mover. Maybe my favorite ride of all the Tomorrowland rides. It was certainly one of my favorite rides ever at Disneyland was the original one. And even though the Walt Disney World version is admittedly a little bit different, it's something I try to ride every chance I get and something I'd ride right now if it wasn't undergoing a little bit of refurbishment. It is hard to imagine Tomorrowland without the People Mover Station there or Space Mountain. It's hard to picture that when you walked in, the thing you saw at the end, the thing that drew you in, was the Skyway Station back then. Sadly, the Skyway to Fantasyland and the Skyway back to Tomorrowland are no longer with us, but the bottom portion of the station building is still here in the form of those restrooms and sort of face painting area in Tomorrowland next door to Space Mountain, which by the way, back in that picture, you can see is just under construction there. Crazy thing is standing here, I was just noticing how that planter, the shape is still the same. It's also the first time I noticed that a lot of the old smooth white sort of concrete benches and building portions here seem to have been intentionally scuffed and roughed up when they did the 90s makeover of Tomorrowland. Interesting. Now before there was a Space Mountain, as you can see here from the Walt Disney World Railroad, it was mostly just grass past the end of Tomorrowland. Not a lot to see, with one exception. And if you were looking carefully, you may have spotted it when the Skyway left this station and headed for Fantasy land unlike at the original magic kingdom in anaheim where it could go in pretty much a straight line the skyway here sort of had to make a wide swing out around the castle which meant that it needed to turn and so although it's now blocked with a lot more trees and buildings back in the day you would have looked over the speedway track out onto that huge blank lawn and seen a big old ugly erector set looking turning station. And that photo was from October 1972, about one year after the park opened. And I'm not sure that would have looked futuristic even back then. It's something that would later be a little more covered up by clever landscaping. But back then, boy, 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 did that stand out. All right, let's just take one second here to appreciate the original Tomorrowland Speedway, AKA Grand Prix Raceway, AKA Disney World Autopia, which is in fact the oldest ride in Tomorrowland and the only opening day attraction still standing using those original Bob Gurr designed Autopia cars. Now, incidentally, this is a total side note, but Bob has told me that if I can get a hold of one of these bodies or make a copy of one of them, and they are out there in the world among collectors. So if I can get a copy made somehow, he told me he will help me put together my own Autopia 
car. Now, I don't have zillions of dollars to buy an original, but if you've got one in your backyard or something like that, let's chat, let's chat. Sorry, you just gotta throw a lot of boomerangs in this world. Most of them won't come back since that's not really what boomerangs do. But every once in a while, something magical happens. Speaking of magic, it is now time for us to head to the most magical land of them all. Fantasyland. And of course, the ultimate symbol of Fantasyland is the castle. It's one of the few things that really hasn't changed much over the years at all. Until recently, of course, with the new paint job. Structurally speaking, however, it's still pretty much the same Cinderella's castle that you would have seen back in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. Well, except for that birthday cake incident. Ooh. You know, while I'm thinking about it, I always thought the side of the castle doesn't get as much respect as it deserves. I mean, look at it. I almost think that looks better than the front in some ways. I mean, that thing is already gargantuan, both really tall and really wide looking from the front. But from this angle, you start to notice, wow, she's nice and girthy too, jeez. Clearly some people felt the same way back in the 1970s. Look at this footage of the side there. I bring it up because from the same exact angle today, you can really see just how much shrubbery has grown up along the pathway behind the castle. Look at that. Those are the same exact rocks over here on the side. But boy, does this whole walkway look and feel different. You still get a good close-up view of the side. You just got to come past the wishing well here. Which, by the way, is looking so nice and cool and clean out here. It's making me thirsty. I just want to drink so bad. Unfortunately, this guy beat me to it. Look at that. All right, onward to Fantasyland. Now, on opening day, Fantasyland was in a bit more forward state than Tomorrowland, but there were still a lot of classic attractions that weren't quite ready yet. Cinderella's Golden Carousel, as it was known back then, was open. It was built in 1917 and was and is still the oldest ride in Magic Kingdom. Now, because of social distancing, they're loading the ride very sparingly, and that means that sometimes the line can get up over an hour long. But that does not seem to deter fans of that classic attraction right there. There has always been a Walt Disney World classic. Other than the eventual name change to Prince Charming's Regal Carousel, as I believe it's called now, really not that much has changed since the old days here on the carousel. Which is kind of what you want in a classic old school carousel. Anyway, I got totally distracted. What I was going to say was, on opening day, It's a Small World was open, but technically Peter Pan didn't open until two days later. I believe the Mickey Mouse Review, which was located right here, the original Snow White's Adventures, not scary yet, which was here, and if I'm not mistaken, Rolly Crump's rendition of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which was right here, were all open on opening day. But 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was located right across the way from Mr. Toad's, didn't open for at least another week and a half. Still though, a lot better and faster than Tomorrowland, huh? Now if we're gonna look into the past in Fantasyland, it's probably best to start at the other end. And that's because all through this area, overhead of where we are now, would have been the Skyway Bucket. These colorful things offered a lot of motion and energy throughout the Disney parks back in the day. And although no one ever likes to mention it, often some surprises. I can distinctly remember being a kid in Disneyland in California and having a penny drop right down between my dad and I and my dad being a little anger. He was grumpier than one of Snow White's seven dwarves. Anyway, as you can see, there are no longer any Skyway buckets cruising along up there in the air above Fantasyland. And if you'll notice in that old school picture, you'll just catch the edge of the original position of the Dumbo ride, which is also no longer there. It used to be located roughly between these two towers. And of course, has since been moved to the far side of what is now the Seven Dwarves Mine Train. Anyway, as you saw, the Skyway buckets crossed over the whole of Fantasyland, cruising all the way down here, sliding down between Peter Pan and It's a Small World, and coming in for a landing basically right over here in the old school and now long gone Fantasyland Skyway Station. And not only is the Skyway long gone, and it had been, you know, gone for a while. But as you see, there's no more pond here. It was significantly altered when they built the Rapunzel restrooms over here. Which are actually still relatively new. And trust me, these things were a big deal. Not only do people like the photo op here with the lanterns, but they also like to have a nice, clean, large restroom to use as well. And actually, if you'll excuse me one moment. Ah, what? 
You gotta go when you gotta go. I always notice in the movies, even in books, no one ever mentions having to go to the bathroom. Well, we all do it every day. Well, hopefully we do. I know, I know. Back to work. Okay, so here you have October 1972. And as you can see, the biggest difference today is no Skyway, of course. But also, I noticed that sort of the tent fronts of It's a Small World are a little different. The layout's a bit different. Certainly the style and the color scheme are still pretty much the same. Just laid out a touch differently. Oh, actually, check this out. If we head to May of 1992, we can see another change in the old uh, color scheme. Looks like that sign is no longer on this portion of the tent, but it all sort of lines up structurally. Oh, now this is interesting. Here's a picture from October of 1972. And looking at it today here at Pinocchio's Village House, you can see not much has changed except the paint scheme. It's pretty crazy. Looking back the other way, and another first anniversary picture, you can see the Peter Pan paint scheme has also changed a little bit. But the most noticeable thing, other than the Skyway being gone, is an old Fantasyland ticket booth. Look at that. I almost didn't notice it at first. Now, I was born literally the year they took away tickets from Disney Park, so it's still hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that to get on any attraction here, you had to purchase tickets separately from your admission. I actually have a couple of shells of old ticket books here with me, and the reason is because they show you what the old original attractions were. This one is from 1973. There's certainly a much shorter list than I'm used to seeing of Magic Kingdom attractions. Now this is interesting. I don't know why these people took so many pictures of the village house, but I was about to say this hasn't changed at all, but look at it today. I never knew this, but they totally moved where the wall and the gate was for the outdoor patio seating. I never would have noticed that they actually moved the old school gate. It's still the same one, but it's in a different location today. Interesting. Oh, dude, it got very warm out here. And as you can see, the spring break crowds are starting to come. I may actually end my trip early and then whip back around at a different time to avoid them as these spring breakers are out in force. Anyway, I've been on my feet in the sun here for six hours. You know what we need? As long as we're talking about classic Disney World rides, let's go and ride one of them, shall we? You know, if we're going old school, let's go with Peter Pan's flight first. Since due to recent controversy, they're actually talking about changing it in particular about taking out uh, Tiger Lily's family, if you know what I mean. Well, things change, but sometimes it's for the best. I'm not saying I personally always know when those times are, but I feel like the older I get, the more I accept that, yep, change happens. All right, and now let's take a ride on It's a Small World, but instead of riding it today, let's ride on it back in the 1970s. ride that attraction and have more or less the exact same ride experience that people had back in the early 1970s. I really wish I could say the same thing about this here behind me. Back on opening day, this was the Mickey Mouse Review, an amazing show where Mickey and a dozen of his friends in animatronic form put on a sick show that was later moved to Tokyo Disneyland when it opened, which is pretty much a clone of the Magic Kingdom Park here at Walt Disney World. Now, don't quote me on it, but I believe the original closed around 1980, but I believe it lived on in Tokyo until like 2009. So there's actually plenty of footage of the Japanese version online today, if you're curious. Ah, I just came to take a seat on this bench here, not because I'm tired, but because in April of 1973, some anonymous person's snapped this photo, apparently, from the very same bench. Wow, look at that. Again, the Skyway is missing. That's the biggest change, but you can see Sir Mickey's didn't have 
the vine growing on top yet. Hmm, must have been before they planted the magic beans. Hmm, you know, as long as we're sitting over here, that reminds me. I've got another photo from March of 1976 of the old Tinkerbell toy shop, which is now the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. See again, a little bit of a different paint job thing going on here. But overall, man, in Fantasyland, they got the epic theming right the first time, so why mess with success? Ah, now here's a heartbreaker. Up until about 2013, I believe, this was Snow White's Scary Adventures. A classic, epic, original Fantasyland dark ride, just like the one at Disneyland, more or less. Now that ride itself changed quite a bit, even on the inside over the years. It was originally just Snow White's Adventures, then Snow White's Scary Adventures, and it was upgraded. And just before it closed, my buddy Adam came in here and rode that ride over and over and over again, all day long. To great comedic effect. So if you have time, go watch that original video. It's pretty funny. All right, real quick, I think I got another Skyway Glamour shot for you. Would you look at the size of that pylon there? Yeah, it was good gargantuan. As you can see, a lot has changed over here since 1976. They've got all this additional stuff here, all these different planters and little spots to sit. This was all added when they expanded Fantasyland. It used to dead end over here. And whoever took that photo back in the day must have been standing here behind what was then Dumbo. I'm assuming probably standing in line over here and just taking a peek at the Skyway. From which, by the way, I have a ton of great shots of Fantasyland over here and the castle and this whole area. But of course, we can't line those up because I can't fly. There's no more Skyway buckets and over here, no more magical flying elephants to ride. Now that Dumbo is out of the way, this became the pathway to new Fantasyland. You got the Little Mermaid back there, the Be Our Guest restaurant, and of course, a pathway along what is now the Seven Dwarves Mine Train. It's slightly, slightly different, but basically, the edge of this ride today, the fence line and where you see that rock work and stuff, pretty closely matches up to the edges of what was then the lagoon for the 20,000 leagues under the sea submarine ride. Which of course was pretty much like the original Disneyland submarine ride, except you were going down in a 20,000 leagues themed Nautilus instead. Now if you're familiar with the Disneyland, somewhat like that you would see the Nautiluses emerging from that rock work, from those waterfalls, coming around this way and then right about sort of close to where you actually enter into the line for the Seven Dwarves Mine Train, right over here in the stroller area would have been the loading dock for the submarine voyage. Like pretty much dead on. If you were to sit on this wall or stand in this little planter separating the stroller parking from the main walkway here, you'd be basically bang on the money exactly where people used to board their submarine. So this photo, which is as recent as 1990, was basically taken from right about here which is crazy. Now that right there, that's a big difference. Now personally, I never got to experience this attraction. By the first time I came to Disney World, they had removed the submarines, they were trying to drain and fill in the lagoon. So it's one of those things that I've always had an undue fascination for. Seems like rides you rode a lot of times and they disappear. You know, you don't care that much, but it's the ones you never got to go on, where you where you don't know exactly where they were that you start to obsess over, you know? Which is why I spent hours trying to figure out exactly where those Nautilus waterfalls were, which were basically bang on the money right here where this restricted gate is. If you look at where the mine train crests that little hill into the loop, that's basically bang on the money, perfect. Now, the only reason this is important is because I would say nine tenths of all the old photos you see of that ride include that rock work, and almost all of them were taken from right about here. The subs would come out from about there and cruise towards the loading dock and all of this was very photogenic lagoon. Now, old school fans miss 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, of course, and why shouldn't they? From Disney's perspective, look at the size of that line. From the very first day, the Seven Dwarves Mine Train has been really, really popular. Well, I doubt it's going anywhere anytime soon. Incidentally, you see those crates up there about halfway up the mountain with the little crane? That's about where the tippy top of the submarine rock work was. Not that any of it is the same rock work, of course, and also about the point where the submerging Nautilus would be entering into the giant show building where the majority of the underwater stuff was housed. Actually, right where we're standing, we would be deep under the ocean inside 
of the ride started about where this rock work was stretched all the way over this modern path and included most of the footprint of what is now the little mermaid show building well at least they kept the under the sea theming going because down there there's no time for troubles and life is the bubbles incidentally if you get in line for the little mermaid if you look carefully you can actually see the craziest hidden nautilus reference ever look at that that is so weird looking. And even when you know exactly what you're looking for and exactly where to look, sometimes you're going, where in the world is that submarine? It's right down there. You gotta look back at the very last spot before you go in the caves that you're along, you know, this sort of outdoor walkway. Uh-oh, now how do I get out of here? I don't wanna ride this ride. Dude, if you think that hidden Nautilus was a crazy magic eye style brain buster, in normal times when you come out of this exit over here, just to the left of this guy, there is the craziest 3D math, hard to see, hidden Mickey in that rock work. Can you even see it? That hurts my brain. How? Anyway, I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, the Nautilus is there because this was the submarine lagoon. Actually, the submarine show building would be right here. So you would have been underwater in the dark in that area. And Gaston's Tavern and Be Our Guest, this whole area over here to the side would have all been backstage. Well, almost all of it, everything but this pathway right here. If you were to stand here in 1990 or 1980, it would have been a miracle because you, my friend, would have been walking on water. And so to reiterate, for future reference, for those that didn't know, from basically that far edge of this pathway, all the way to the other side of the mine train area. All of that was Nautilus territory, 20,000 leagues under the sea. And if you want to give your friends a little Disney secret knowledge, that is Dumbo's original berth right over here, basically starting from just inside of these two towers here and extending outward. I mean, a pretty good distance. Probably to right about here or so. I mean, it took up a, a sizable portion of real estate and then nobody ever mentions it, but if you want to impress your friends with the facts, this was not the loading area for the submarines. No, 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 no. You got to look a little to the right. Line up your satellite photos correctly and you'll see it was right there on that planter right in the stroller parking area. All right, and now back to zipping through time. Let's say we were to stand in this area back in the mid 1970s. Not only would you be seeing a lot more polyester pants, you'd also be seeing a giant Skyway pylon over there and the line and shrubbery on the edge of the submarine lagoon. But over on the right, where today we see the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, back in the day was the entrance for Mr. Toad's wild ride. See that sort of little stubby tower and that flag over there? The entrance was just to the right of it, right down here. And that is where you would board the old classic dark ride, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which had two tracks with two different story paths at the Walt Disney World version. Were a little more roly crump eyes, a little weirder, a little more wacky in there. I mean, the original at Disneyland will always be the original, but I know a lot of people who will say it was one of the greatest dark rides ever built right here at Magic Kingdom. Now there's another sneaky hidden Nautilus inside of Winnie the Pooh's tree right there. Unfortunately, it's closed off during the pandemic here. I always thought that was weird because the submarine lagoon wasn't over there. It was on this side of the path. But anyway, inside Winnie the Pooh, there's a much more fitting tribute over here that I've shown a bunch of times previously, which is inside of Owl's house. If you look back, there's Mr. Toad handing over the deed. And that one just makes way more sense. Mr. Toad probably sold his ride to buy a Zeppelin or something. All right, one last shot of Mr. Toad to give you an idea of exactly where the entrance was. I've got a photo here from my friend Ken Stack of Stack's Liberty Ranch. It's hard to see through the shrubbery, but you'll see that little circular tower with the purple flag like I was telling you about before. And then off to the right, there's a little square one. Right now there's a little red or orange flag up there. And between the two, basically right here, behold, was the entrance to Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Dude, look at that. Don't you just wanna hop on there? I do. Now that photo was taken in 1976 and that is basically right here today. So if you're staring at that book from the outside, it would have been straight in there behind it. And all of this stuff would have been a much wider walkway because that would have been the loading platform for the submarine. So, you know, you would have had a little bit of uh, a break this way. Quite a shift, man. Quite a crazy shift. Now again, we can't get on the Skyway today, but here's a photo of that submarine lagoon. There's the rock work and that white in the background. 
That's the giant show building back there. Now off in the other direction, this photo is back from January 1972 from up on the Skyway and look down there. You see the old carousel. You can see all the way to the Contemporary Hotel. And as you get closer to Tomorrowland with this speedway off in the background, you'll notice down below you the Mad Tea Party with no cover on it. Nowadays, of course, it has this crazy sort of steampunk style roof to keep the sun and the rain off of you, but back then, nothing. And if you look in the background, no Space Mountain. There's the Contemporary back there, the Skyway Station, and that is about it. Not even Carousel of Progress yet. Boy, Tomorrowland was a lot different in 1972. One more, one more looking back. Back in 1972 again, you can see just how close the Submarine Lagoon is to the Mad Tea Party which still has no cover, of course. It's just all so completely different. Past the Mad Tea Party. This was the dead end of the road back here. There was no Storybook Circus. There wasn't even a Mickey's Toontown yet. That would all come much, much later. Boy, these things are loud. I missed that smell. Ah, goes right through the mask. All right, now normally during these history investigations, I only like to proceed in bright sunlight. When the sun gets a little too low in the sky, that's usually when I'd call it quits for the day. But you know what, with the spring break crowds coming in and all the park reservations full. Like I said, I think I may end up heading back to California a little early and then cruising back again in a couple weeks, especially because I'm told that if I go home right now, I may have an opportunity to get the vaccine. That is something I, I think we all I think we'd all like to get, right? So we are going to continue into Adventureland, Frontierland, Liberty Square, but first, I forgot two then and now shots in Tomorrowland earlier. First, there's this one. I mean, how is that for not a lot changing in all these years, huh? I mean, of course, the people mover tracks weren't there, but otherwise, dang. And then I don't know how in the world I forgot about this one, but take a look at exiting Tomorrowland today versus exiting Tomorrowland in August of 1978. Okay, that is a crazy transformation. Look at that. There are whole palm tree planters missing nowadays. Personally, I think it looked cooler before, but that's just my design aesthetic. You know one day when they change all the wacky 90s stuff they put in here, people will miss this version too. Although I must say for the record, in the last couple of years, they really cleaned this place up. All right, deja vu, but we're exiting Tomorrowland again. And I know this adventure is getting way longer than it should be, but if we pick up the pace and I simplify a little bit here, we should have enough time to squeeze in at least a little bit of Liberty Square, Frontierland, and my favorite land of them all, Adventureland. Dude, I could live in Adventureland. As a matter of fact, I basically do. After all, the R stands for adventure. It is my favorite land of all of the lands. Something about an exotic, mystical adventure. I mean, it's the same reason we all gravitate towards Star Wars or Star Trek. We want to we want to go somewhere so different, so so far away, so exotic. It's funny, I was once going down Route 66, and I was on the side of the road in Illinois, talking to this Japanese tourist who had come with a big tour group. And they were taking motorcycles uh, out to LA down Route 66, you know, and he's taking pictures of this weird stretch of road with just like McDonald's on and stuff while I was talking to him. And I go, let me ask you like, what is it about this that's, that's exciting to you? And he was like, it's just so exotic. So, you know, so depending on where you are, I'm sure if I lived in a place that looked like Adventureland and needed a mosquito net every night, I'd be like, oh, please take me to the desert. But as it is, me and this guy back in the 70s, we're into Adventureland, man. We're into it. I mean, it's got skulls and stuff. Everybody knows skulls are cool. Ooh, and masks. Just ask Kylo Ren. Masks are very cool. That'd be sick if, like, every time there was a pandemic or we needed these, we all had, like, full wooden face masks. You know, with, with some kind of this type of thing inside. No? Never mind. All right. Now, look this way, guys. Now, some of you have no doubt heard rumors that there's a secret club in this location now, which I can and will neither... Confirm nor deny. What I can tell you is people are definitely eating and drinking in there back in 1973, because back in 1973, this right here, my friends, is the Adventureland Veranda and Veranda Juice Bar. Now what you'll notice, if you look carefully, is that the old patio has been totally walled in and the building up there has doubled in size. Yes! I mean, it's still not very large, so the Adventureland Veranda and juice bar must have been a pretty small operation. Wow, nice place. Too bad they don't use it for anything now, right? Right, right? Yeah. Too bad I, it's not a juice bar because 
I'm really thirsty. Oh, I'd love to be in there. Now, Adventureland was also pretty barren when it first opened up. Matter of fact, in the remnants of this old ticket book, which I believe is from 72 or very early 73, you can see that Adventureland only lists three attractions. And over in this front half, there were just two. The Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, which is still here and still terrifying. And of course, the ever popular then and now, Jungle Cruise. Now the Jungle Cruise is always popular. People love boats, they love jungles, and of course they're hearing that there may be changes happening to this ride in the near future. So everybody wants to get one last round of the old school version. But back in the day, man, I'm telling you, it was even more popular. If you were to look at somebody's photos from a Disneyland or Disney World trip, probably half of them would be from the Jungle Cruise. Seriously, I've got a ridiculous amount of old-timey Jungle Cruise photos, all kinds of plastic animals and deadly gators. So on a day like today, when the line is a little too long for me to indulge in, I just jump right back in time, and I'm cruising through the jungle. Oh. Ooh, watch out, so many animals. Ugh. We had to jump back to the present. We were about to head into headhunter territory, and that's a terrible place to be headed. <laughs> Ah. I'm quoting, of course, from the ride for all you angry beavers out there. Now the third attraction was, of course, the Tiki Room over here, which debuted on opening day. And as you can see here in 1976, used to have much shorter palm trees. Dang, look at that. You'll notice though that in that list of attractions, you don't see the words Tiki Room anywhere. And that's because originally the Disney World version was known as the Tropical Serenade. Man, you'll notice that not much but the shrubbery has changed out here since 1972. Today it looks pretty much the same, except I cannot get the same angle of that first photo. Because obviously today, Aladdin's flying carpets takes up a lot of real estate here. Back in the day though, there was no such thing. Adventureland was much more wide open. Same thing went for the reverse angle when you were looking back at the Tiki Room and the Sunshine Tree Terrace back then. But craziest of all is that there was no Pirates of the Caribbean back then in Adventureland and originally there were no plans for one. I think they figured because we were on the East and Gulf Coast out here in Florida that none of the people out here would be interested in pirate stuff. A little too close to home. It really is a Dole Whip swirl right now. Man, I'm so hot and thirsty, I'd even take a swirly. Uh, well, maybe not. All right, friends, at least let me grab some water really quick. You know what? While I do that, why don't you guys go and take a ride on Pirates really quick? Which, by the way, finally did open in December of 1973. So they whipped that one up pretty quickly, which is probably why the ride here in Magic Kingdom is a little bit shorter than the original Disneyland version. First time I've had my mask off all day. Dude, I basically inhaled the Dole Whip that I got. Now I'm just chugging some water. It's been a long one. And as you can see, the light is fading. We are running out of time, so we're gonna hurry up through this next portion, because even though I'll be back to do more in a few weeks, we can't talk about Magic Kingdom history without talking about Liberty Square. After all, Liberty Square is all about history. American history. It is all based on colonial America, from the buildings right down to the refuse in the streets that I believe I was the first one to refer to, well, at least in the videos, Oh, so lovingly, uh, the poop trail. Here we have replicas of the Liberty Tree. And of course, the Liberty Bell. And all of this was originally sort of planned for Main Street USA in Disneyland. It would have sort of been an expansion off of Town Square or off of Center Street. They tried various ideas, even announced some of them, like an international street, which eventually morphed into World Showcase at Epcot today, and a Liberty Street, which of course became Liberty Square when they came up with the Magic Kingdom. It is the only land in the Magic Kingdom, as far as I know, to not have a major renovation, which means whatever vintage photos I have don't look vintage at all because Nothing has really changed here. I mean, sure, some of the shrubbery has gotten bigger and they've moved around some of the outdoor seating and little tiny things. But for the most part, between today and the mid 1970s, I can't even tell the difference. Plus, not only did all three of Liberty Square's official list of attractions open up on opening day, including the Magic Kingdom version of the Haunted Mansion, but all of them are still here and still operating. 
Sort of. The Hall of Presidents, an animated show much like our Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, only featuring many, many, many more President illustrious executives, States. has been here and been running since the beginning, but they have added quite a few presidents since 1971. If my count isn't totally wrong, I believe it's nine, right? Well, or at least it will be nine, as they are working on adding the new one right now. Now, of course, the third attraction listed was the old-timey riverboat. And as you can see, there is still an old-timey steam-powered riverboat operating today. But that, my friends, is the Liberty Bell, and it is not the original Magic Kingdom riverboat. The original riverboat here at Magic Kingdom was called the Admiral Joe Fowler, and technically, actually, he didn't make it on opening day. He came the next day, October 2nd. I guess the old gentleman was feeling a might uh, temperamental that first day. Anyway, this boat, originally named the Richard F. Irvine, wouldn't start plying its way around these rivers until 1973. Now, the simplest way to tell them apart, in old photos especially, is that the Richard F. Irvine Irvine, aka the Liberty Bell now, has that one single smokestack up there. Whereas the original Joe Fowler riverboat had a double stack, much like the Mark Twain riverboat back at Disneyland, you know? Now the old Admiral Joe Fowler was a much beloved ship named of course for Joe Fowler, the actual retired Navy man who helped Walt Disney originally build his first Rivers of America and his fleet of boats here at Magic Kingdom as well. Unfortunately, the old original Admiral Joe Fowler is no longer with us at Magic Kingdom because of one of those freak accidents of history by which I mean a freak accident. In 1980, after nine long years of service, they were moving the Admiral Joe Fowler into a dry dock with a crane. When apparently, somehow, some way, and who knows who took the blame, it was accidentally dropped. Dude, and not just dropped a little bit, like fully Heimbucked dropped. Now the Richard F. Irvine was named for a former Disney employee. It wouldn't be renamed as the Liberty Bell until 1996. I guess because they figured most people were like, who's Richard Irvine? However, both Dick Irvine and Admiral Joe Fowler are now commemorated in the names of some of the ferry boats crossing the Seven Seas Lagoon, so they're still sailing away. Like sticks. All right, now I know some of you are gonna go, wait a minute, what about the keel boats? And yes, they did load right over there in the center of your screen, right in Liberty Square. And they were open back in 1971, 72, 73. But, and don't ask me why I don't make the rules, instead of the keel boats being listed as a Liberty Square attraction, they were listed as a Frontierland attraction. And if you don't believe me, I got one million old ticket books and pamphlets to prove it. Now it's my guess that Frontierland got the keelboats because it really needed some attractions to list. Other than the keelboats, on opening day itself, I believe Frontierland only had two more attractions, which were the Davy Crockett Explorer canoes that are long gone now from Magic Kingdom, and the world premiere of something epic, the freaking mighty Country Bear Jamboree. Dude, in 1971, those animatronic bears were blowing people's minds. No one had ever seen anything like this. We were less than 10 years from the first real big animatronic show, which was the Enchanted Tiki Room at Disneyland, opening up at all, so this was brand new technology on a scale and with a southern flavor for the southern visitors to Disney World that absolutely blew people away. It is still a huge fan favorite. Sometimes, you know, you'll see nobody in there at all, but then when rumors start to circulate, as they do from time to time, that it's gonna close or be changed, all of a sudden, even in modern times, it's a packed house, standing room only. Oh, good old Big Al and your Ursine friends, may you live on here at Magic Kingdom forever. Her sign. That's right, right? It's not equine, that's horse. Ah, eh, let it stay. Now look at this on the outside. You can see not too much has changed here. The basic structure of much of Frontierland was perfectly in place back in the 1970s and into the 80s when that photo was from all the way up until today. But what's that in the background back there in the 80s? You might ask, you eagle-eyed viewer. Well, I'll tell you. That was our third Frontierland attraction. Bang on at the dead end of the street was this, the original 
Frontierland Railroad Station. Here you're seeing it back in, I believe, the late 1970s in its original form, and it was listed as one of the opening day attractions, the train station. Nowadays, when you get to the end of Frontierland, you are basically surrounded by Splash Mountain. But as you can see in this other photo from 1976, look down there at the end, there was nothing back there. Until they built Big Thunder Mountain in 1980, this was it, this was the end of Frontierland. The train station was the end of the road and as you took the railroad around the outskirts of Magic Kingdom things were a lot more bare the trees were a lot shorter than they are today Ooh, and I very much wish we could get on a train right now and I could show you how things have changed but of course unfortunately the railroad is still down now Splash Mountain didn't open up here until 1992 and of course the railroad tracks are now sitting behind it over here and then go through it but back in the day when you reached the end of Frontierland if you peeked around the station you could still very much see the naked tracks back there and just like today parades would enter and exit through this area and you can see what that looked like like right here in this photo sent to us by Stax Liberty Ranch, which by the way publishes a series of rare theme park history books at, I believe, StaxLibertyRanch.com. Anyway, it almost looks like it's some kind of rare sneaky sneaking around backstage photo, but it isn't. It's just that Frontierland just sort of ended into the wilderness back then. Boy, it is one big contrast to the way that it looks today back here, I'll tell you that. And even the train station, man, that little simple Frontierland Railroad Station, thanks again to Manifest Destiny and the westward expansion of the park, became a thing of the past when it was replaced by this guy up here, which sadly, like I said, we can't visit at the moment, but which I will readily admit is way, way cooler than the old version. For starters, come on, it's up there on the second story that rules and it's sort of set up to resemble old logging mills or old lumber stations which of course perfectly matches the theming of an old school log flume ride now i'm not sure it's going to happen quickly it may take a couple of years but the established plan is of course to re-theme splash mountain and without mentioning things i shouldn't repeat i have heard it's not going to be just a simple overlay with tiana characters oh no i understand that it's going to be a major major re-theme of this whole little area so it'll be interesting to see what they do with the railroad station all right guys as you see the sun has done its duty it's going home to sleep well and soon we must also but even though it didn't show up until the 80s we can't leave without mentioning big thunder mountain after all it's only the wildest ride in the wilderness and thanks to rob sending in this photo we can see exactly what it looked like back in 1985 dude honestly other than the plants not that much has really changed. I mean, when you jump back and forth, you can kind of tell that obviously this fast pass roof over here was sort of blocking off parts of the other buildings. And as a consequence of the fast pass thing and the new rise, I'm sure the stonework was redone a little. It definitely at least subtly shifted where you entered the ride. But basically, since 1980, my friends, which was a long, long time ago, I don't even want to say how long. Ooh. Hello, ducks. Dude, those were battle ducks. I could watch those all day. <laughs> but anyway, basically since 1980, the wildest ride in the wilderness has stayed just as wild as it ever was. Now, Frontierland would also gain another attraction in 1973, not long after opening, which is, of course, the much beloved, at least in my house, Tom Sawyer Island, which is still going strong out there. In fact, Scott, thank you, Scott, sent me an old photo where you could plainly see it under construction, which is pretty cool. Hopefully Tom Sawyer Island here never changes because it is a beautiful, beautiful place. And I'm genuinely bummed I don't have more time to go over there on this trip. I have so many more vintage photos and old footage, so much more time traveling and then and now to do with you guys here at the Magic Kingdom. And of course, don't even get me started on Epcot. Dude, we have so much Epcot to check out. It is ridiculous. Unfortunately, this is where our history journey ends for now. In the past 24 hours, a whole fleet of spring breakers has taken up all the reservations for the parks for the next week or so that I was gonna be out here. And I can't remember if I mentioned this already or not, but I'm told that if I make it back home in the next couple of days, I may have a shot. <laughs> 
huh, at getting that Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a good thing. So I've got one more random day at Walt Disney World. We're gonna have one more random adventure, and then we'll go home for a couple of weeks to California. Maybe do a little bit of road tripping, then I'm gonna have my birthday on March 25th, and then we'll be heading back this way. There's more gold to find here at Magic Kingdom, and a lot more 50th anniversary celebrating and history looking to do. So rest assured, my friends, we will be back for more. For now, though, we've done our duty. It's time to go home and sleep well. tell them apart in vintage photos is that the Richard F. Irvine, which is now the Liberty Bell, has only one steam stack up there. Woo, it's getting breezy. Almost lost my hat there. I actually have the shells of some old ticket booths. Ticket booths? Booths. And that, of course, my friends, brings us to our final land. I'm trying not to say it. I'm trying not to say it. I'm trying to hold it in. Or should I say our final frontier? I had to, what are you gonna do? Hashtag horse cart. Nailed it. 